Corey Sarnola, and welcome to the latest episode of the Fearless and Devotion podcast. Myself, Andrew Pollard. We've got Andrew Gilpin as well. We've got Reese. We've got Tim. We've got a four team, four pronged attack today uh, with a whole lot to talk about in terms of reflecting on, on the weekend and looking forward uh, to next week as well. First and foremost, though, of course, a shout out to our sponsors, the Fat Ball Group. There's Fat Boy in Mold, Wrexham, uh, Carnivore, Epi's, Cross Howell, The Buck in Banger, Hill Street Social, My Squin, and probably something else by the time uh, this pod goes out. And also the newsletter uh, to uh, obviously go and give that some love. We got a link Andy or are we just nah um, I nah. mean to be honest the introductory offer is has finished so I doubt anyone's going to subscribe for... I mean you should it's still a great value <laughs> for 40 quid but um, uh, I, I, I don't think anyone's going to rush to do it so soon after the introductory uh, offer is has finished but thanks for everyone who did I had a great great response I had about 50 or 60 extra subscribers and I'm really really thankful for for those guys thank you very much there is a free gift coming out to the to the 400 for sorry 400th subscriber so I will sort something out and get it in the post I can say Andy Gilpin is a man of his word I've seen him in the flesh give a, a subscriber a, a was it that, was that the 300th or yeah somebody 300th. Got... yeah we've got a little uh, little pack of uh, Wrexham goodies so yeah um... I'll try and do something similar to uh, just to quickly stick with yourself, Andy, because I am I am always prepared to eat humble pie. I, I feel like we have to uh, collectively apologise for Alpine Gate because I take were... no pleasure in being right. I take zero pleasure in being right. Just just saying that's uh, that's an apology for myself who has zero interest in Formula One, and we all went Barry Big Bollocks with it's it's Alpine, it's it's, Al- it's Alpine. But let's move on from that, Mister Gilpine, and let's move on to Wrexham to Crawley one, Elliot Lee, Max Cloweth with uh, another goal. Uh, well, Max Cloweth with a goal and an assist. Uh, well, there's a lot more to talk about with Max to to, to come. Uh, I, I think I thought Barney, who got man in the match first half, particularly was was fantastic. For me, Max was the man in the match. George Dobson again back to just being a Rolls Royce. To ball he put in for for max's max's goal but i think that the, the first talking point we should probably start with is the decision to uh, to drop jack marriott and go with um the, the familiar duo with ollie palmer and paul mullin which didn't quite work now uh tim uh, obviously you were there at the, the games so we'll start with your your, uh, your good self uh what what did you make of that because it seems obviously on the, the back of the Birmingham game as well. We've got a very frustrated Paul Mullen here who's just desperate for a goal. And it's just not there was he had a few chances, but it's just not quite clicking at the moment. Yeah, he's not quite quite there just at this moment in time. So it was, it was I can kind of understand it because first and foremost it's Parky's preferred duo, isn't it? Marriott and uh, Mullen and Palmer always has been tried and tested. We know what they can do together. I just think it kind of came back to bite Parky a little bit. Didn't quite work out as we all would have hoped and imagined. Mullins still rusty, and we can see that. Um, and you've got to feel sorry for Marriott. I mean, four goals in six. Yeah. Yes, he's been fortuitous with a couple of those goals, but you know it's a good record. And anybody else who scores four goals in six games doesn't get dropped, do they? But then not every other team's got Paul Mullin in it, so it's a difficult one. But I think when Marriott has come on, I think he's. He's pretty much told everybody, including Parky, you don't drop me again, because I thought he was really good when he came on. Very, very alive. Um, just just seemed to add a bit more urgency in what was an overall fairly lethargic performance, to be honest. Yeah, it was... I think Crawley, Crawley had some some decent plays in there. They knocked it about quite well at times. And it was a, a very grounded out win for us, which in some ways I think maybe was a, a nice way to bounce back. Obviously, we'd love to see, you know, a 3-0, 4-0, 5-0 cruising easy, but the fact that we had to scrap for it. Um, I, I think with the, the Jack Marriott one, I mean, and before yesterday, it was four goals in five games, and you're thinking off the back of that to then be dropped. Um, Andy, if you're Jack Marriott, what is that mindset there? Because it, like Tim said, he came on and he he was he was very lively, chasing lots of things down. There was one moment in particular where he got to like the, the far corner, uh, the, the right side, well, the tech end corner, and he, he he chased down his lost cause, and then there was just nobody there with him. But so he's showing very much willing. But how are you if that you know you're getting dropped after that four goals in five games you're coming on the back of? Um, I I thought it was a harsh decision. I, I sort of did sort of say last on the last pod that I, I didn't think it would be long before Mullin came back in. I did actually surmise he might come in for Palmer. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think. If I'm being absolutely honest, a fit Paul Mullin gives you more up front than Jack Marriott. He, he gives you goals, but he gives you a lot more. 
He gives, you know, he, just the way he works defenders, um, it, it, it's a joy to watch. He, he's, he never gives defenders a, a moment's peace. And that's why him and Palmer have been such a successful strike partnership. Um, but Marriott's got to feel hard done to. Um, I think really and truly, would I have dropped him? Probably not. I would have maybe found a way to to, to keep him in, in, in the team. I feel... I, I, as I say, I, f- I felt for him and I'm glad he did well when he came on. Now, you know, Jack Marriott took a while to get going, but needed that preseason, needed that time with with with, um, with the players, got the togetherness that this squad has because they do do a lot of good sort of team building morale stuff, Vegas, things like that. You know, that's, that, that sort of really welds a team together. And I think... The start of the season, two things happened for Marriott. One, he was completely fit, and two, he knew that Mullin wasn't going to play for a bit. So he knew he wasn't going to get dropped after, I don't know, come on, you know, do sixty minutes and then get dropped. And I think he sort of we saw a different side to him than we than we did last season. And you know, he he is a threat. He is a goal threat. Long term, I think when Mullin's fully fit, he will come back into the team. Uh, but I wonder if there is a way that you can play Marriott and and Mullin together. Yeah, I was um, talking to um, a couple of long-time Reds, both uh, 40 plus years following Rex and one from Cardiff, one from Manchester at uh, the weekend before the game. And we, what it was the conversation was like, I think people maybe forgot that Jack Marriott had been a, a League One player for a long time, a Championship player for a long time. He got fits and starts towards the end of last season. He get the odd game here, the odd 20 minutes, 10 minutes here, and then we've we've kind of reaped the rewards of him, like you said, Andy, just getting the chance to start the season, knowing that he's going to get a run, regardless of where he scores. Obviously, he started off well with that absolute screamer against Wickham, which will have done him um, no no harm whatsoever. Yeah, but with yourself, Reese, how how are you looking at it? For Obviously, we'll get further detailed uh, preview into the the, the game coming up uh, next weekend um, against Leighton Orient. But are you thinking Parkey goes back to Jack Marriott for for that game? uh, Or is it you stick with Paul Mullin? I thought he goes back to Marriott frankly. Um, and, you know, I agree with Andy. I'm not sure I would have made that call. That said, you know, you, you never know what's going on in the dynamic of a squad and in training as well. And, you know, from Parkey's perspective, you've got someone of Mullin's quality. Um, you also want to give Mullin more time because you want Mullin to get up to speed. So it's that kind of balancing act of, do we just pick what I think is the best front two right now today? Or do I also weigh in the fact that I want to get some minutes in the tank for Mullin? Um, and also, he, he, you know, you don't know what's been going on. He might, he might be thinking, actually, I'd quite like Marriott to, have a, you know, to, to really fight for it some more. Maybe I don't want him to be too complacent. I don't think the shirt's his yet. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think I'd go back to Marriott and I'd be looking to bring, bring Mullin on in, in good time off the bench. Um, and just, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it would be great to have that you know, scenario, if we've got all those top four, well, five now, strikers fighting fit, that's just an un- unbelievable sort of uh, squad depth. Um, but obviously we will get injuries as well. So what he doesn't want is for Mullin to be undercooked when that happens. So I can sympathise with him as well. He wants to get those minutes in the in the bank. Yeah, it's it's one of them where obviously uh, obviously Mull scored in the uh, the trophy game against Salford, but it's you see he's just he's desperate for that league goal, and and it was there was a a, a moment in the the first half at the weekend where he's literally just punching the floor in the, in, the, in the penalty box because it's not quite gone right. But as mentioned, it was a it wasn't. I mean, Parky talked about it himself after the game. It wasn't a classic, you know, performance where you're going to look back and think, Poof, we, we were cracking that day. We did enough to get through. It was a, an ugly win, you can see. But it's uh, it's it's three points, and that's that's all I'm bothered about. But is that, Tim, to come back to you, Is that do you take that as a good sign? The fact we bounced back from Birmingham, yeah, it's not been amazing, but it's been the fact that the lads dug in and, and got a result out of that against a, a Crawley team that put up a, <laughs> a heck of a fight. Yeah, I thought I thought... Probably, probably the best team to come here since maybe MK Dons start of last season in terms of how they played without any sort of fear and didn't come to sit back, didn't come for a point. They came to win, and you know, on another day they could have easily got that win. You know, we we, we had a lot of luck on our side yesterday. I think there's a couple of key moments that went our way, but um, it is it is the sign of a good team. It's a sign. It's a sign of a solid team, and it's a sign of a team that doesn't like to lose. Um, consistently, like it's right. Okay, we, we were deservedly beaten. We hold our hands up. Let's see how we can b- bounce back. And it was, I said last week it was going to be tetchy, and I felt I felt that was the case. And and it was what I thought. Crawley were far better than us in terms of how they played the game. They were just more fluid with the ball. 
more adventurous, to be honest, a bit more rapid in their play and, and their turnovers than, than what we were. So, but I think you're going to get you're going to get moments like that, and if you can ride out games where you're not at your best but can still somehow eke out a win, then you know I mean I think that that kind of says a lot about the character of the team, a lot about the kind of atmosphere and and this kind of fortress thing. That I mean even the atmosphere yesterday was a bit was way below what it normally was. And we th- sometimes you argue does that transcend to the pitch, but I think on the whole. They just gritted it out. We, we took we took our chances. They didn't. Um, it was a very very kind of bitty kind of disjointed kind of affair, really, from from our point of view. Um, but yeah, on, on the whole, you can't argue with it. I mean, when was the last time we really got schooled at home and then won? I mean, I, well, I was going to say as well. It's, can't think. It's something of a cliche as well, isn't it? But we talked about it before. How losing is not the end of the world, and these freak outs that some some fans have when we lose a game is ridiculous. Losing two in a row is a bit of a problem. Suddenly you lose three, then yeah, fair enough. And you know, you can lose quite a lot of ground in the league table. It's the, the most important thing to do after we after you lose. So after after like Birmingham last week, we just needed to win yesterday. It doesn't matter how it was done. So that rut is over. Mm. Doesn't matter how the performance is like we've won. Now we can crack on and start worrying about performances as far as I'm concerned. Parky's Parky's always been very good at that. Anytime we have a loss, we've not really gone on a, on a very long losing run. He does tend to win the next game uh, pretty much uh, like clockwork. Just one thing, coming back to Mullin, I don't want to label the point, but I don't think Mullin's got a League One goal yet, has he, in his career? No. So no, but- if he comes up from Cambridge, he was supposed to go to League One that season. Um, he didn't get there. He came down to us in the National League. I think he's desperate to show that he is a League One striker. And I think that's why he's so keen to 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 get that goal. Um, but you know, I, I didn't see a lot of the game. I saw bits of it. I was at the golf yesterday at Wentworth, and um, it was quite hard to get to get a signal. But Max, I mean, I'm running out of superlatives for him. I mean, yeah. a goal and an assist. Um, he's the, the highlights I saw. He defend seemed to defend it well as as well. I mean. Phew. We've got some player on our hands. I know we say it nearly every week, but you know the true, the true sort of caliber of a player is you know how how good are they when they go up a level? And Max has just got better again in League One, uh, and that sort of leads me to think that if he went to Championship or even beyond there, he could cope. Yeah, I'd agree totally. And um, I have to be that that nerdy geek stat. Uh, Paul Mullin did score, I think, three goals in League One for Tranmere. But so they don't really count the tramps. But yeah, with, with Max, it was yesterday a goal and assist. Um, and there was a there was a, a, a just a brilliant through ball he played to Ollie Palmer in the first half. It, it ended up in a corner for us, and not much came of it. Uh, but it was just just the weight of the pass. Uh, he's really progressing to being such a great ball playing defender, as well as that physicality that's come. Because there was a spell where Max was, some would say, bullied in finger quotes. Where he was picked out as the weak link a couple of seasons ago, just because of his age. But just the the leaps and bounds he's made. And you're thinking, like, where is the limit? I mean, we, we had Jordan Davis at the Mice Quinn on um, on Saturday as a pre-match guest, and that topic came up. We talked about Max, and, and Jordan was amazed at the, pro- the, the, the progress that, that Max has made. And it's like, where can he go from here? Uh, obviously, wherever he goes in terms of standards and levels, we want it to be with Wrexham. Um, now, Tim brought up a, a topic a couple of weeks ago about you know interest in January in Max Clover. There's, there's there will be interest. There's there's we already know that people are looking at him already. What? <laughs> obviously, we want to keep him, but if 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 there was something to come in, what would be that kind of what do you how what's the value you put on Max Clover right now in terms of fiscal financial value? Oof. I don't know. I mean, I would say you're looking. Uh, Wrexham don't need to sell. That's the, exactly. that's the first thing. That they, he's on a three year deal. Um, with, it's a club that's going places. They don't need to sell. So it needs to be an initial outlay of, I don't know, five million. But then I think the add ons there can really make make it, you know, max worth something um, a lot in, in the future. And, you know, we we often say you know it's it's a lot to build a training ground it's a lot to to set up an academy but just having one Max Kluwer pays for it all and yeah. you know Robin Ryan will will know the value of bringing in young players seeing them come through and then selling them on for for for, for big money that's what a lot of clubs do to survive we don't need to do it as much but 
just that one sort of signing, say we did get five million for him, that would go straight back into the team. Just think what we could do in other areas of the pitch with with that money. It would be it would be fantastic. Uh, caveat: I don't want Max to go. I'm not, I was going to say that the, <laughs> you forget that like the, the player. I mean. That five million could buy, depending on where you read, a quarter of Jay Stansfield. <laughs> um, but but it's it, in terms of there is the player there as well. Like we, we saw in the summer, there was interest uh, from was it Coventry, I believe, in in Norwich, Tom O'Connor. Well, was it Norwich? Was, was no, I was, I, was, I was thinking about Tom O'Connor and the fact that Tom oh, O'Connor okay, yeah, yeah. wasn't interested and just chose to stay at Wrexham because he saw where we're going and he wanted to be part of that journey. But it was like for, for the, the longest time, what's the time since I've been watching Wrexham? It's always been the we need to sell to just just to basically keep things ticking over. You can go back to like Lee Jones to Liverpool. Brian Hughes was a big one. Uh, Leo Roberts when he went into Wigan, that partly funded some of the. The, the, the Price Griffiths stand as it was at the time, the Mill Road stand. So we've always had that need to develop players, sell them on, and then that was it. And that's why Brian Flynn was so good because he was just really so good at bringing the young lads through. But when we're not in that position now, I mean, would five million be? Could we turn that down? I I, I don't know. Maybe who knows? But um, t- Tim, what are you thinking the trajectory of Max Cloth? Where where can he go to? How long can we keep hold of him? And would you think he could? He'd want to stay here with us. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, I think when we spoke to him last year or the start of this season, um, he said that you know the, the kind of plan for him is to is ideally to to sort of progress through the leagues with Rex. I think he actually said that. I might clip that up and get it out, but I'm sure he said that. Ultimately, it, it, you know the geography works for him, as the saying goes, and he's not doesn't live a million miles away. He will be on a decent wage. He can probably command a better wage. He's you know, signed a long term deal, um, so I think he's happy where he is. I think that. The progress he's made is, is that will 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 have been given a massive confidence boost, and I just think, in terms of the culture at the club, the the the, the players he's learning off, you know, I, I, it's a risk, it's a gamble for him. It, it could be a case of right, okay, let's say for example, Leeds come in and offer five million quid, but we'll loan him back to you for the rest of the season. Okay, maybe it's a win-win, you know, short term for us. So. But yeah, it's it's an odd situation because we've we, our hand hasn't been tested yet in that regard. Nobody's come in and said, "Right, we know you've got money, but let's let's really see where you're at in terms of attempting offer for one of your best players." And it, I don't think nobody will want to stand in his way because he deserves to play at the highest level. And ultimately, it'll come down to him, his agent, to say, "Well, what do you want to do?" Because you could go there, but you might not get any game time. And then does that? therefore impinge the progress he's making so it's a difficult one to balance and that was probably the similar sort of thing that arthur had to weigh up it's like where do you go next do you go at a higher level but there's no guarantee and you get you know, bits of games here there and everywhere are you going to be happy with that no so there needs to be that balance and i, I think he's a very very sensible guy he's very you know he's, he's, he's been well guided he's come up through the through the youth ranks and then uh, Tight. The good thing about it is age is on his side. He could probably have a two, two or three more seasons here and still get a move if our progress, you know, sort of set, tailed off a little bit, if you like. So if we didn't go up this year, we didn't go up next year, and he thought, oh, I'm 23, 24 now, maybe I need a move. He's still got plenty. He's still not in, even in his prime yet. You know, he's it's made a hundred appearances for Rexham. Yeah, centre you know, off. It's they mature later. Yeah, yeah, but but if you think I mean appearances he's got under his belt, how many promotions he's got under his belt, how many goals he started to get under his belt, those noughts are just adding to the sort of transfer fee that you would command for him. So, and just going back to his assist and the, and, and the goal yesterday, the goal was great because he just creates the room. But look look at his assist, right? Because he's already he already notice, notices where Elliot Lee is before the ball's even come in. Because when, when, when he keeps that ball, he could let it go out from the corner, he keeps it alive. It doesn't even look he just whips it back round to where Lee is because he's he's already figured out he's not going to move from there. So it's just great awareness, great vision, and you know I think the sponsors need to take a long hard look at themselves and start giving them to people who deserve it, like Max Clueless. Well, that, 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 that's it. It was uh, for me. I thought Max was man in the match. Although to be fair, when when it was announced, because people are swayed by goals, I guess. But when it was announced. Ryan Bonnet was man of the match. Max hadn't scored. He still he'd had an excellent game. I thought probably deserved man of the match on his performance, regardless of the goal. But at Barney first half, 
again, I don't know if that's because it was playing on my side. I'm literally second row on, on, on that half, the, the cop half, so I'll call it. And Barney was just, he had them on toast and was just, just, just brilliant. Um, but Barry, just a, a last one um, on, on Matt's Claire before you move on. Uh, what, how, how good is it to have a goal scoring centre back? It's like Aaron Hayden was brilliant at that. Big Dennis Lawrence back in the day was was great at that. Uh, so it's yeah, it's just nice to have a centre back where you're thinking, yeah, he's going to get one today. Yeah, and also uh, I didn't think that's what he was. To be fair, of the yeah. evidence of the first few seasons, you know, he's really evolved quite quickly into into offering himself up as a goal threat, um, which is class. And yeah, I mean, I. I, I agree, echo the thoughts. I mean, the, the only thing I would say is, that, as Tim was saying, with that sort of weighing up that he would do if there was an offer that came in the same way that Oconquo did, you know, I know it's easy for us to say this, but you still think, where's better um, sort of not in the Premier League at the moment, if you look at the next two, three years? Because of the evidence of the first month of this season, you know, we're going to be pushing at least for the championship uh, for the next couple of seasons, and hopefully we'll get there. Um, you know, within the next three years or so. So he's looking at it going, this is going to be quite fun. What, you know, the winning football, enjoying this football, it would have to be a very good offer from a big club, I would have thought, to tempt him. So hopefully yeah. that's on side. Yeah, I agree totally. You mentioned Arthur Oconquo there. That there was a, a moment where on Saturday it was, I mean, I've been going to the race course for many, many years and I think it could well be the worst miss I have ever seen um yeah uh, amando junior quiterna um who missed an absolutely to be fair to him he did score the equalizer for for, for crawley so I, I can't knock him totally but the other moment where arthur came rushing out of his goal there was a ball through arthur came rushing out and some are questioned whether he's a bit too eager to come out either way the ball got knocked around him and then the guy it made ronnie rosenthal look like a close miss like a near miss it was just i've yeah but um, to, to go back to you, because I feel like whenever we talk about Arthur Tim, we have to start with you, your good self. Was was he a little bit hasty there, or was it one of those you have to go for it, and you're going to win the majority of those those balls? You know what? It's a difficult one because if Arthur get if Arthur gets that wrong, he's getting sent off because yeah. he was so close to clattering into him and. I don't know if the guy was too quick or whether Arthur moves his leg slightly last minute, but he comes hairing out. And maybe that, maybe on one hand, that does enough to slightly put him off and forces the ball, not 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 even slightly wide, because he's still got the entire goal to aim from. But then you've got, I think, two or three players tracking back, like McLean on the line, who probably would have handballed it or something, they probably would have taken over the team, I'd imagine. But I just thought it was a bit of a rush of blood to the head. And I was like, oh, man. He, he, I mean, it's a great ball over. I think Max might have been playing that loud on side, I think. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it was a horrible miss. So that's when we got off. And that was just before... When was that? Was that the start? That was at the end of the first half, wasn't it? It was, yeah. It was 1-0. We were winning 1-0 yeah. at the time. Yeah. And it was it was that. And I can, yeah. I can almost see the logic he's yeah. gone with where... He's thinking the keeper might somehow get back. That the, there might be a defender on the line to so slide in. So I need to put a bit of height on it. But he's just gone and blasted it. It was oh, it was like the it's, baby it's of Ronnie. Uh, I I said he Mahetta Malonga'd it over the bar. That was about as close as I can I can I, possibly say. But the, the, tell you one thing. Do you want to explain that fast, reference to some newer fans? Tim? Fast. Oh, it was uh, the... Mahetta Malongo is now the, he's the chief executive of the PFA. Ch- chairman of the PFA. Me? Yeah, he's chairman, played for yeah. Wrexham. I'll okay. loan briefly. Um, was... He long blocked. He, he, he long blocked for this in devotion on Twitter. I've got no idea. Really? Why, why no he way. That yeah. <laughs> so I'm guessing he doesn't take too kindly to any, any criticism about being absolutely rubbish at Wrexham, where he once had a shot and it cleared the old cop from about six yards out. Uh, it's yeah. some spectacular miss. So if, if you think that that, that miss was bad was yesterday, Mahetta Malongo takes the biscuit for. I'd have to see him back now in comparison because I, I was there for the Malongo one. I mean, my mates still take the mick out of it to this very day. But I don't know. The one on Saturday seemed worse. But now you're like, I might have to reevaluate this. No, but the he... Malongo was it was definitely closer in. Um, when I was at the Daily Post, there was a rumor going around that Mahetta Malongo was a, a traffic warden in in um, Blind of Hustinyog. Uh <laughs> And I actually what said a niche someone... rumor that is. Yeah, I actually sent someone to go and go and see if they could track him down, but then he turns up. He's chairman of the PFA, so I don't know what to believe now. No, I know he's done some some great work uh, for um, for for a few things lately. So I'm not going to dig him out too much yeah, in yeah. his role as the PFA chairman. But so, uh, I, I would I want to hear more about Andy sending out 
little little keen young reporters who are feet up on the desk smoking a cigar. Hey, you go to Blind for Stinion and find <laughs> out who's man of a long yeah, Try and get a parking <laughs> ticket. Get me better than Longo. Don't come back without him. Yeah. <laughs> well, Longo would slap a, a parking fine on a car and probably miss it. That's the problem we have there. <laughs> oh, just just done the pavement instead, right? The pavement you've got to take. Anyway, if, if anybody knows Mahetta, please tell him to unblock us and, and get him on. We'd love to have him on to discuss that. Oh, that would be great. Right, yeah. Uh, it's his, yeah, it's like what six games. Um, and just I've I mean, I'm sure he's a lovely fella. Like I said, he's I know he's done he a lot of nice. good for a certain cause at the moment, uh, was, is in his role, but dude, man, just not a very good footballer. Um, I like that he's blocked though. Oh, well, he's, he's blocked you. I mean, I think the only person that's blocked me is Shawn Michaels, and that's because I'm a massive Bret Hart fan. That's called wrestling nerd. But <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I, I've scoured our, our ex account, so have I ever really slagged him off to a point? I don't. I mean, you know what? He can't dress he up. Missed that of well, He played. In, he appeared in a couple of worst ever teams in the fanzine. So I don't know if that might be it. I'm. I'm blocked by Matt <laughs> Lucas for some reason. What? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, wow. I mean, if, if, if you're, if you're blocked by any celebrities, get in touch. Let us know who you're blocked yeah. by. Let us know yeah. in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. I mean, which George. random celebrities have blocked you? Um, but yeah, that miss at the weekend. It's like Matt there. Lucas. George Lucas. Uh, Matt Lucas, not George Lucas. I would yeah. be, oh, I, I would be furious. George Lucas, so upset if George Lucas came onto Twitter just to block me. It's that, it's that goddamn Gilpin getting blocked. No, I'm, I'm sure he's he's too busy counting his Disney money, George Lucas, to even be on Twitter. But yeah, that 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 miss at the weekend, it was it was like the baby of Ronnie Rosen's Isle and Malongo. It was just like it was. It was dire. But anyway, like I said, the guy, the fella scored against us. So, you know, he got the equalizer. But moving on to um, it, was, it, was it was, it was a really, really nice goal. He took it really well. There, there was some controversy because the, the linesman was in front of me um, and the linesman raised his flag for an offside and then he put his flag down. And so, obviously, they score some, rightly, some of our players are like, well, hold on, the Lino's flag there. We've not necessarily stopped, but we've felt a bit more at ease and they've gone through and scored, which was. Yeah, that the the, the Lino got a, a lot of grief, uh, a lot of grief from the the, the mole road for the rest of the game, and it was yeah, just the obviously that played a massive part in the six minutes of injury uh, injury time added on at the end because of the stoppages for that. That Ollie Palmer was straight over with with the Lino, and then Paul Mullin made a big point of calling Ollie away before then shouting at the Lino to do his effing job. It's like that's kind of the same thing Ollie was saying, but it's it, it's it's all right. But uh, right, I guess we should move on to another topic. Uh, Tim, you mentioned a bit before about how. The atmosphere is maybe a little bit flat um, at the weekend. There were um, a lot of tickets left on the day, I, I believe. Now, we, we did have, I think it was Thursday, that Crawley returned the top tier allocation. So a bunch of tickets went on sale again then. And I, I believe you could even get tickets on the day, uh, walk up. And it was our, our lowest home league attendance of the season, um, 12,732, which... It's crazy here to, to to say like, well, twelve thousand seven hundred thirty-two. That's a low number, which is is nuts. I've seen Wrexham with you know two and a half thousand, eighteen hundred even at times. Uh, two hundred thirty-two away fans uh, from from Crawley, which Google told me today is a four-hour, sixteen-minute trip on a good day, let alone with the horrific weather we had on Saturday. So what what do we um what do we attribute that to? That the I mean, in terms of the the fact that you could, for, for once, you could actually walk up to a Wrexham game on the day and get a ticket, seemingly. Everyone's it's lost be. interest. It'll all end in tears. No. Uh, the owners will give up. And, yeah, I think this is the beginning <laughs> of the end. Yes. Um, yes. Getting bored. Getting They're getting bored. Getting bored. Uh, well, the, the, the key thing is Crawley only sold 230 tickets. I mean, that's... And we only had them back on Thursday. So, you know, that's, that's why that attendance is so low. Usually, the away team sells out that... that their their allocation because they want to come come and watch watch Wrexham up here. So you know that's exactly why it was it was a low crowd. I mean, the other thing is the weather was terrible, and I don't know if I would hate to have been in the temporary car. Oh, uh, oh mate, yeah, grim. That looked grim. I, I, I was in the mall road. Even you couldn't be asked. Even you, even, even you couldn't be asked watching it, Andy. So you know you went golfing instead. So it couldn't have had that kind of golfing. attractive appeal. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, didn't go, I, I didn't play the the, the BMW uh, the BMW Invitational, mate. I'm 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 not that good. Me and Rory McIlroy on the on the 16th. Um, I try. I, yeah, you're right. I should have. I didn't go to the or, or watch the game, but um, but that that would have been. It was hospitality. I'm not going to give up hospitality tickets for the BMW International, am I? 
so so you 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 you've always said that. Yeah, you've you, always you, been consistent with that as well to be fair you, yeah. you, you could have given hospitality tickets there at the, the BMW <laughs> Open, or you could have maybe got a ticket in the uh, very open, very exposed to the um, the, the weather uh, temporary stand. I, 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 I mean, to be fair, we, we, it sounds awful to say because uh, it was torrential. Hor- we'll get to the weather in a bit, but it was it was well timed because it was like it was on my my little weather app on my phone. It was like you know thundery storms at like two o'clock, then it was three o'clock, then it was five or half five, and we managed to get to like the 92nd minute before it did just just uh, that in fact we might as well talk about it now Let, let's crack into it it was it was some of the worst weather i've ever seen at a football game um and it just for the people in the temporary cop i felt so bad for him because obviously there's uh, no roof i believe it's because it's a temporary stand you're not allowed by regulations to have a roof on there but it was grim and i, I had the prospect of i can leave the game uh obviously after the final whistle and have a half half hour walk home in this biblical weather or i can go five minutes in it to the mice win and get cover under a little beer truck outside which probably wasn't clever in hindsight because it's made out of metal and there was lightning all over the place um but just with with the weather i mean lads which any games particularly you've been to where you've been subject to dire conditions one one for me stockport 2003 boxing day where I luckily I was in the 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 area with a roof, but there were just so many wrecks of fans. I remember Jacko with his top off trying to get over into the 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 uh, the area with the roof because the other stop put away area was uh, open and and Rocky Barrett got us an 88th minute winner, poor Barrett. But yeah, what what's the the worst games you've been to in terms of weather where it stands out? Just like oh, this is uh, awful. Woking away, woking away was the Mac- coldest Mac- I've ever been. Uh I've had to look it up. Uh, I was in uni. I went to watch on my own Kidderminster Harriers uh, away in December. I drunkenly tried to swing on a lamppost the night before and fallen and scraped like all down my side as I was reading over. Like, you know, and it had gone like sticky, you know, like when you uh, your sticks to it. Yeah. Uh, it was unbelievably cold. And I re- I knew the result was shit. But I didn't remember how shit until I just looked it up. So, yeah, we lost 2 0. Uh, fifty seventh minute. Jamil Matt scored for them, and then Nathan Blissett finished us off in the last minute. Um, yeah, that was shit, and it was very cold. Well, we've had uh, sticky and finished off in the same sentence. There, Reese, well done. Uh, <laughs> over to you, Tim. Uh, probably from Macclesfield a couple of years ago, where it was like driving snow, like sideways snow. It was horrible. We lost. We were crap, and um, that was particularly bad. Um. I'm pretty sure Stoke and the FA Cup was freezing cold. That that was a grim old day. But in terms in terms of outright sort of wet weather, I kind of feel like it must have been Stoke. It always always rains in Stoke. But yeah, yesterday was was just horrible. That's probably the worst um, rain that those players have seen since probably that storm, that electrical storm in America. And we played was it Chelsea and the auto run for cover and the, the game was delayed and all that sort of stuff. But just to just quickly touching on on the atmosphere thing. I, if we're talking around, you know, a sort of thousand people drop up, like you said, it's not the end of the world. What does it come down to? I don't really know. There's no way people are just suddenly going, oh, I can't be asking what direction because they've lost the game and deservedly lost the game and were second best. doesn't work like that. But it was a weird one. It was a slightly muted, subdued atmosphere. But we got there. But it was a muted and subdued occasion, you know, you know 90th yeah. anniversary exactly. of the Grassroot disaster today. Obviously, we marked that occasion yesterday. Um, whether that comes into the thinking don't really know maybe maybe you know there's a lot a lot, lot of people that will have lost relatives you know in, in, in that disaster so maybe that played a part in some regard but yeah the, the weatherest day I, I saw you after in, in the mg i should have stayed in the tech end for five minutes because I, I decided to make a dart for it i only had my long sleeve black shirt on and i did the tech end to the mice green in under under 58 59 seconds that was rapid for me but it was waste of time and then i i apologize to every bloke who came into the uh the mg toilet to see me topless putting my uh my long sleeve shirt under the hand dryer for about 15 20 minutes hogging it to try and dry it out because i just looked like i'd been scuba diving it was then, bad it was bad yeah the, then just to put it back on and walk out and then get soaked again <laughs> it was uh it was <laughs> nice to do. and to be fair to him i mean because obviously we had a, we had a, a pint together i saw you there it was <laughs> I, I felt like an idiot because i had a denim jacket on you had no jacket at all, which makes me feel like mildly smart <laughs> in comparison. There, what was what was I thinking? Uh, there? 
what I think I, I trust the BBC uh, weather app too much. Maybe I need to go to AccuView or somewhere else because there was nothing to suggest there was any thunder and lightning and, and rain of that that nature. But on, on that you know what? Read, At least it, I was going to say I read a really interesting fair, article. To Richard Walker, you know, Sorry, mate. Carry on. I was going to say the MG they they cranked up the heat and it was like a sauna in the MG after it was roasting. So they they got people supping whilst they're also drying people out. So that was nice. I read an article last week that said that BBC Weather App was the least reliable for on the day weather. Mm. So you should right. Well, well, any recommendations? Reese Williams. I I I, I hold BBC on my team. It's just factual. They looked at ones uh, like for, for an hour ahead and four hours ahead, and BBC was more reliable days in advance, but was less reliable on the on the day. So you hear it here first. Okay, I'll, I'll no, like no, no bias there at all. No, no dog in the uh, the hunt there, Reese. No, exactly, not at all. <laughs> I didn't have a weather service. No, we, we um, yeah, we mentioned it earlier. We have to uh, address it at a very serious topic. Obviously, the the, the Gresford the disaster, ninetieth anniversary, which is today as we're recording it, twenty uh, second of September, nineteen thirty four, two hundred sixty six lives lost. Um, the Miners Project did such a great job again, as they always, they always do, just highlighting this. That the club themselves, you had Liam Liam Stokes Massey, who's just that what what a, what a lad, what, what a guy, uh, what an artist who designed a, a logo for this. Uh, there was badges available, t-shirts available. Obviously, we wore a, a special uh, version of the black kit to, to mark the day. Um, just, it was, as it always is with the club, it's just, it was really well handled and obviously a very sensitive um, issue. Yeah. Um, nothing I can really add to that. They do, they do stuff like this really well. Um, mm. So, yeah. Well done yeah. to them. And they had the volunteers with the the candles. Uh, well, the earliest hour this morning as we were recording this, because around like two a.m. they were putting putting the, the the final candles out, and it's just it was just it's it's really nice, nicely done, and it's obviously it's a uh, an awful tragedy, but it's just nice that the club and the the fan base and, and the town remembers it in such a um, on such a pedestal, such a, an emotional way every every year um, to uh, to one of those who sadly lost their lives ninety years ago. Um, Jay, right, Jay, who who was involved in the commission of of that new logo, he sat next to me yesterday for the game, and you know, for, for him to, to for him to do that uh, and to commission it, and, and and for the for Liam and the powers that be at the club to, to, to for that to go ahead, and obviously the, the, those shirts that were worn by both the men's and the women's teams are going to be auctioned off. Proud moment for him, you know, he's putting he's put plenty back into the community here, you know, with with the food bank and this that and the other, and. Give me a pin badge. So yeah, it, it was a lovely, lovely um, thing for him to do and to suggest, and and it, it just looks it's great. And also, it, it is... keeps that memory firmly sorry. alive. Sorry, Tim, you cut out for me then, so I started. Go on, sorry, apologise. I was going to say Humphrey is still fundraising for the Rex, Rex and Miners Institute, isn't he? So do go and check out his social media. Um, to see how you can donate there because they really are a fantastic um, place, a uh, fantastic resource there just across the road from the stadium. So go and visit too if you're in town. Um, and I, was, on that note, gents, I'm going to have to go uh, enjoy finishing the podcast without me. Um, um, what I was going to say was, is how disappointed I was not to be on the podcast last week when we finally lost, when I'm in my element. Yeah. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the the chat and I hope, well... Hopefully it doesn't happen again this season, but we'll see. What's um, your prediction for you? Prediction, uh, Lake Norian home? Uh, away. away. Away, of course. Um, one all. Thank you very much. <sighs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Cheers, Reese. Oh, have a good one. Uh, right. One, one other uh, kind of, I guess... Is it a major topic? Is it not a major to topic? Is it something about nothing uh, that we have to address either way? Is the uh, to stand or not to stand? Uh, the, the club this past week put out a, a statement about, as they put it, persistent standing in seated areas. Uh, some of the, the, the oh, I say it was it was a big old statement, but some of the the, the the key points, I guess, is if persistent standing is not stopped, we could face further action, including reduced capacity. Uh, also, that the club faces further punishment if persistent standing continues, including the closure of block of seats or even entire stands uh there's a whole lot of the, that similar sentiment throughout it all uh what, what what do we make of this tim you go first this is a subject closer to your heart 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of had my my ten pence worth um, on a, on a post I put out the other day, so I'm just trying to trying to find that, and then I can kind of elaborate on it. But ultimately, um, it, it's a funny one because I, I think it, it it merely comes down to common courtesy for your fellow fan. It's as simple as that. I can like, like, I say quite rightly or wrongly, depending on your perception, is you you can't play a drum, a marching drum, sat down, right? And most choirs don't sing when they're sat down. So there's this element of standing up creates to an atmosphere. There is safe standing on a lot of grounds. There isn't safe standing at ours at the moment until that cop is built. So that therefore that presents some sort of problem. Um, it's a difficult one because I, I, there was an occasion where I brought my mum to a, it might have been a, a league game or a, Bristol Street Motors game, whatever I can't remember. It was it was still busy, you know. There was, there was still there was there was no spare seats around or any of that sort of stuff. Um, so ultimately, um, somebody stood up in front, and I I sort of said, "Would you be all right to sit down?" Because my mum's not in a position where she can stand up for lengthy periods of time, and I just got like a huff, and I sat down. It's like, well, it's just courtesy, you know. I, I'm fortunate in the sense that people who are behind me stand up, so I have the best of both worlds. I can sit, I can stand. The issue that the club have brought attention to is persistent standing. Um, that's probably come down from EFL. I think there's, there's several other clubs that have put out um, other other kind of statements in, in recent months. So it's not just us. We're not being picked on per se. But I think it's it's a difficult one. Sorry, it's my dog howling in the background. Um, it's a difficult one to to get right because the the gap between me and the seats in front of me is very very minimal. I'm smashing my knees into it when I'm sat down. So sometimes you think, oh, well, I'll stand up because it's not crushing my knees. So, but that's only the tech, and I can only account for that. So, it is a an issue, um, but I think it's going to be one of those that it's it's not going to see everybody. I, I've had people sort of shout back to me, say, well, I don't care if Doris from Brumbo comes up. That's not the way it is. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. That's sorry. That's a shit attitude to have. It's the wrong yeah. attitude to have. You know, somebody, if somebody comes and sits, sits next to me or in front of me or behind me, that's not normally there. Let's let's say the people behind me are going on a holiday. They've sold the tickets. Somebody comes along and it's a guy who's, who's on a crutch or it's a guy who can't stand for any length of time or whatever. And I'm standing in front of him. I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm, I'm just going to sit down because he's paid the same amount of money as me. Why should I be blocking his view? It's not fair. It simply isn't fair. So I get why people's backs up out about it. And I know Andy's laughing at me because there's squeaking going on in the background because my my. It's like you're staging to... your own uh, your own showing of sooty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Long story short, for me, it should simply be about consideration for other people. If it's an issue and somebody asks you to, don't go down that route. Well, I always stand up and I'm always here. That's not that's not the right way of looking at it. But I can see why people are, are getting het up about it as well. It's a difficult one. It, it really is. Yeah, I've got like there's a behind me. There's a, a young lad. I I don't know how old he is. He could be eight, ten, twelve. But he obviously a, a smaller fella. And it's just like it, yeah, I I'm always aware of. Uh, and, and to be fair, I didn't pick up on it because I, I'm not one of those that stands all game. I just you know if we get a goal or if there's a chance, you get off the edge of your seat and you stood up. And there was what one game where is is I assume it's his dad just kind of like oh keep. And it's like, yep. Yeah, oh, sorry, I didn't even think about that. And then I'm very wary, wary of that these days. But I'm only in the second row as well, so I'm not not um, too bad on that. What What's your thoughts on on this uh, situation as we try to wrap things up, Andy? Um, look, I I can't stand where I sit in the uh, in the sort of is it what's it called Sainsbury stand? God, it's not not been called a Sainsbury stand for ages, is it? Wrexham Lager, uh, Yale. Yeah, it's the, the Yale Lager to me. Stand. It's always a Yale. Yeah, so I'm a couple of I'm a couple of uh, rows back from the press box, and behind me there's there's older people, and they can't yeah. they can't stand. So I don't. I mean, like like you, I will jump up if there's a goal. I'll celebrate around there, but I'll sit back down again. Um, what I will say is it's great away from home where everyone is standing, yeah. um, and it does really help the atmosphere. And I understand why it really generates that and why they want to do it in the tech end. And if everyone in that block is of the same mind, I don't see particularly see a problem with it. But if it's dotted around the ground and people are just sort of standing up for, for no reason, no, I don't think I don't think that's that's on really. I think you have to you have to have courtesy for, for your fellow fans. Um it, but again, you know, this isn't a Wrexham rule. This has been passed down from the EFL and it's like Wrexham are vilified for for a lot of things that 
you know, you can't film matches or, you know, do vlogs or things like that. Well, again, it's, it's not Wrexham who are, who are really sort of doing this. It's, it, it is more an EFL ruling. Um, and I understand that they do try and have to, have to curb, curb these sort of things. What was it like yesterday? Were the people still standing in the, in the corner of the MRS? Um, I didn't see too much from where I am. I've not got the, the greatest viewpoint because I'm kind of, kind of center center of the pitch slightly cup end is where i am so it's 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 <laughs> tough to, to see a little bit at times but I, I um i don't know i think for me it it's almost obviously it's a very different situation but it reminds me a little bit of the that declan rice second yellow card the other week for arsenal where it, it there is a point here um, in terms of how the club have handled it as in like that referee that was it was such a soft yellow card to send him off but it was one that had to happen. They, the ref had to do it. He, he had no choice. And that kind of feels like us, as in like, yeah, we we don't really want to do this. It's a bit bit petty and daft, but we have to be seen to be doing this because that is that is the rules. Um, I, I think that's a, enough chatter about that. And uh, Wrexham women uh, played today, uh, played against the Britain Ferry, lost 3-0 away. It's, it's been a tough start for the women. Uh, obviously, this is on the back of losing 2-0 to Cardiff. Uh, Cardiff, obviously, uh, the, the team in the league. And then you look at it, though, the next game, though, is, is Swansea uh, home next weekend, next Sunday. What uh, a start. To, That's a really know, tough start, isn't it? It's, it's a tough one. 10 past 5, kick off down at the Rock, if you can get down there next Sunday for Swansea. Uh, and then they've got Aberystwyth away. Um, so it's... it's <laughs> Even in terms of travel, that's that the, the Everest one is a heck of a, a trip. As somebody who spent many years down there myself, but yeah, what what do we make of the, the, the start of the ladies? Should we read too much into it? And it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's been unfortunate. And I think they'll. I, I mean, you, you, it's one of those where I was going to say like I think they'll bounce back next game, but then it is it's Swansea, which are, it's that's a massive game, tough game. Is it the stuff or is it the Kairas that game? Um, they moved it to. The- Oh, is it, is it the Kairas that one? Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah, sure. yeah that that is yeah. the game. Yeah, that moves to the Kairas. So ten past five at the race course. Not I the mean, rock. You... Yeah, um, they've played two. They haven't scored a goal yet. Conceded mm. five. Very tough start. However, um, support them. You know, get get a decent crowd in at the game next next week. You know, if you're not going to late in Orient, late in Orient, you want your football fix. Um, you know, that's Sunday's the game for you. So get down there, support them. Had a, had a, a poor start, you know, for usually a, a side that doesn't have any issue scoring goals. So they'll need that confidence boost. So if you can get down there and support them, and um, I'm sure they'll give Swansea a, a good run for their money in that game after a, a slightly disappointing start for them, but they'll come good. Yeah, that's... it's a grind, isn't it? It's it's a grind because they're going, they're having to travel to South Wales all the time, uh, mm. and you know when got a uh, when the, the the rugby team up here did that, uh, the one based in in um, in Colwyn Bay, it became a real real grind for them. I'm glad they're semi they're semi pro. I'm glad they're getting some money, and and that probably takes the pressure off off their work a little bit because if they didn't have that, then the, the constant travelling would really really start to bite i think uh but you know they did so well last season um but you know it it will it will um it will start to to take its toll toll uh, toll i think yeah um it's it's one of them where now i realize i can go to the game because that that is the game at the race course because before when it was at the rocks i have to work till four o'clock on sundays it would have i wouldn't be able to make it there but now it's i've realized that's the game that's at the race course then I'll, I'll be there cheering them on hopefully it's not as bad of weather as this weekend has been but uh, yeah if you can get yourself down to the race course for the the wrecks of women and hopefully uh get get some points on the board against against swansea because even even a point against swansea would be uh be a very good result because swansea a very decent outfit now a, a team who could be a decent outfit in terms of the men's team they, they've had a bit of a ropey start but they put things together the last few weeks latent orient um now, two weeks ago, they had zero points on the board. They they lost all games. Then, I mean, they even got pumped three 0 by the slops, and that that says a lot because the slops are dire this season. I will happily throw in any dig about those six fingered sons of guns. But anyway, they're in twentieth place at the moment, which I don't think does justice to their 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 position. Then they've had a tough start, like ourselves. They've had Bolton and Birmingham, and they lost two one very close games in both of those games. And then they beat Reading, and then they've gone back to back, and they they absolutely turned over Stockport four one at the weekend, which a result which I don't think anyone saw coming, but has to be credit where it, where it's due. So this 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 could be uh, should be will be probably I'd imagine a very tough game at the, the weekend, Andy. 
Yeah, I'm going. Um, I don't really have many happy memories of uh, of Orient. Uh, I can remember once me and Chris, my mate Chris, it was the day that we we had no chance of the playoffs, or it was mathematically confirmed that we couldn't get into the playoffs, and we just sat there for about fifteen minutes, just sort of disgruntled. Uh, we're, we're all the Orient fans giving us the finger. So yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen us win there. I'm going to... Oh, actually, I remember I did. Remember the promotion season, 2002, 2003. Mm. I'm pretty sure we went down there and won. Um, and Trundle... was the game Trundle missed, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I have seen us win there, but not recently. Uh, but it is a good night out. It is a good sort of day out. And there's some really good pubs in, in Leighton. So get down there. Um, well... Also, a few of the people who I work with support Orient, so it's nice to have a bit of needle, and they're going to go to the match as well. So, yeah, uh, just before you get get your thoughts, Tim, Andy, you can't because there are going to be Wrexham fans here listening to this who are going to be going down to the game. You mentioned there, there's some good pubs. Any any particular recommendations? The engineer is the one that we're we're, we're looking at, and the coaching horses. So the engineer is, I think, it's the one on the high street. It's just been revamped, um, and I've been there a few times. It's uh, it's a Good old quaint pub. So, yeah, I would get yourself down there. Sounds like a, a good plan. I mean, they've clearly, like I said, they've had a bit of a, a really tough start, but back to back wins over Reading and Stockport, especially Stockport away 4 1. Ethan Galbraith scoring two there. Uh, someone who's came through at Man United has had interest in the summer from championship clubs. I believe Middlesbrough and Sunderland were, were amongst two of them um, who were, were keen to try and get him to, to move. Uh, Tim, what, what are you thinking from this game and what would what would realistically be a uh, expectations of a of a good result for Wrexham? Uh, given that the fact they've secured back to back league wins, I think a draw is fairly respectable. Um, but like Andy just said, we're, we're due in. In two thousand three was the last time we won there. Obviously, take <laughs> forget the, the the time spent in the national league in brackets. But it's been a while. Um, one good thing in in our favour is that Leighton Orient play on Tuesday against Peterborough at home. So I imagine Parky will be scouting them there for that, or he'll send somebody. So we'll have fresher legs than, than they will. I saw the Stockport highlights. They absolutely ripped them apart. They ripped them apart. So what that says about them or Stockport, it's hard to say. But you know, you don't get a Stockport and win 4-1 without being a half-decent team. They've had a, a squiffy start. So I think based on that, and the Redding one's a bit of an awkward one. They, they beat Redding, didn't they, as well? And it's they're poor this season, Redding, to be perfectly honest. So it's hard to read what, what sort of game we can expect. I think it'll be tough, but as is always the, the classic case, isn't it, is that you win your home games and you try and pick up the odd point or win here and there on the road. And I I, I would take a draw there. I, I really would. I, think, I don't think it would be a, a massive disaster, all things considered, where we are. So, yeah, take that all day long. But... With the addition of those threat, fresh legs, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Um. Uh, a quick one from both of you, gents. Uh. Firstly, a scoreline prediction, and also secondly, what changes, if any, do you think Parky will make? Uh, I'm gonna. I wanted one all, like Reese. I'll, I'll go two each. Two each. I think it will be a draw. I do think he might get Marriott back in. I wonder if he might play Mullin and Marriott. Okay. Um which would be a departure from what he normally does. And I, we, we know that he loves a focal point like Palmer, but Mullin can play a version of that role, if you know what I mean. He can be the guy who, who holds the ball up and really harries the, the, the defenders. And, you know, Marriott, if he's full of running and full of confidence, that could be an interesting partnership. Um, so may, maybe that. And maybe Ravan gets a, gets a game because having the pace to track back uh, was, was vital against Bolton. And it looks like Orient are a pacey side, so I would like a little bit more pace in. He's never going to drop McLean, so maybe he might he might decide to to rest Barnet. Tim, uh, yeah, I mean, we we all said last week that maybe that was the time for for Mullin to start, but we didn't necessarily expect him to start with Palmer. So I think he probably will revert back to to having Marriott in there because I think we still got to ease Mullin back in. You know, we, we know he's desperate to score. He's probably overcooking things at the moment, lashing out and maybe overthinking the, the shot selection and stuff. But it'll come good. He's a natural goal scorer. So, but I just think easing back in slowly but surely, and then we've got him for a busy Christmas period, New Year, and he'll, he'll be firing by then, hopefully. So I think Marriott starts for me, probably, 
I'll be honest, probably for Mullin. I think he comes back in with Palmer personally um, at, at this at this juncture. It, it's a difficult one to to work out, but uh, and yeah, I think I think that'll be it. I think I think McLean could do with a bit of a breather, but I don't think he's going to have one, um, and I don't think no. he would want one. If any play, if you tell any any player they're going to be having a re- breather, it's, it's going to be not going to be him that you want to tell. So um, yeah, I wouldn't surprise to see Revan have a have a have a start as well. Um, I think that's it. I think those are, those are the ones. Um, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, really. Uh, you going for three 0 win? Said also, I'm not oh, going to go no, for three 0 I mean, win. Andrew Pollard always goes for a three 0 win, so always make yeah, three 0 I think I was going to go two 0 at town, but now you've kind of brought that back up. I kind of have to go three. Well, the three 0s always at home, so no, I'm going to, I'm going to go two 0 um, I think for the town because I, I think I think we'll be okay. I think Jack Murray will come back in. Um, I thought Seb Ravan did did really well when he came on at the weekend. So you, you it, that that's the the conundrum we're in. There's so many players that can come in and do a really good job. I was uh, mentioning it to you. Actually, no, it was to Tim at the weekend about how you when we make subs, there's no drop in quality. There's just so many players that are just top top level. So now I'm going two nil the time. Uh, I think we'll be all right. Um, and one very last thing I just want to talk about something that um I know it's just before we start recording this before we wrap up. Mark Williams, former Exum striker, uh, today announced that uh, this afternoon announced that he's stepping back from football to take a break from the game uh, to focus on his family and work commitments. Um, scored a penalty earlier this season, of course, recruit for Carnarvon Town to uh, to win away against the Crusaders in the Europa Conference League, getting them a, a trip to Legia Warsaw. Uh, 36 years of age, bang on exactly 100 games for Wrexham. Uh, did have some injury troubles here, which kind of hampered him. Um, but the, the partnership we had with Jefferson Louis, our first season in the um, the, the National League, the Vanarama, the, the, the Blue Square Premier, as it was called back then. Uh, just a, a top, top lad is is, is Willow, as Mark. Uh, it does some great work across the UK and the world these days in terms of education around gambling within football. Um, so I just thought if, if if this is it for his playing career, I just want to give him a little bit of a shout out. Played for Aberystwyth Town, uh, Flandern, no, uh, Cohen Bay, Carnarvon, Kidderminster, Northwich, and kind of tarnished it for playing by the Jesters down the road. But yeah, just a, a little shout out to Mark that if this is it, then yeah, what the, what the career he's had. Yeah, well done, Mark. Yeah. Good For a good career. Yeah. It's, yeah. Nice, it's always nice to have brother, bro, brothers in the team as well, isn't it? Him, him oh, and yeah, Mike. Yeah, always, yeah. Mark, Mark and Mike, Mike, yeah. Yeah, Mark and Mike too. Yeah. Again, both both of them lovely fellas. Absolutely top, top lads. But that has been it. Again, the plug for the newsletter. Go and check the newsletter out. Loads of fantastic uh, content there. Uh, again, thank you to our sponsors, the Fat Ball Group. So you've got the Fat Ball in Rex and Mold, Carnivore, Effies, Chris Howell, The Buck, Hill Street Social, and my squin. Tim has got his finger up for one last thing. What is it, Tim? You want my prediction, I'm guessing. Oh, I, I, thought, it, yeah. I thought you'd gone one all. Oh, no, that was Reese. Reese went one no. all. Andy went 2 2 2. Yeah. I'm going to go for a ball draw, nil nil. Oh, Just because wow. we haven't had them for ages. I know, yeah. Right. So it's yeah. highly unlikely. So I'm, I'm hoping that it tempts us into a 3 0 win or something. But yeah, I'm going to go ball draw and I'll take it. A nice clean sheet again. Happy days. Okay, okay. It's uh, a point's better than no points. So, so yeah, we'll see how we get on Leighton Orient on uh, on Saturday. But that has been it for the uh, the latest episode of Philston Devotion. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for your time, gentlemen. Uh, Andy Gilpin, Tim Edwards, myself, Andrew Pollard. Be well, be good. Have a, a good weekend, week, whatever you're doing. Have fun. I think that's it. We're yeah. done. I'm just talking see out you. words. Yeah. 100%. Bye-bye. Go drive. Take care. Bye-bye.